Good morning, good morgen, buongiorno to everyone, to add some languages. Um, let me uh, briefly recall again, I, I mentioned it briefly yesterday already, um, a little bit what the guidelines are. So the, the purpose of the guidelines is basically to, to bring together social development and responsible fisheries. As we heard yesterday also, I, I did not assist all the discussions in the evening session, but it is about, about creating that enabling environment within which some small-scale fisheries sector can thrive. So the guidelines are, are in a tool, are an instrument that, that should help to support individuals and communities to develop their capabilities to actively and meaningfully participate in decision-making. And again, here we heard very often the, the importance of, of participation, of, of being part of processes, of contributing to processes. And as Nasik was saying, civil society, all of you have been involved very much right from the beginning in the development of these guidelines. I already mentioned yesterday the guidelines, they, 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 they are not an instrument in isolation. They are an additional instrument that co complements international instruments that already exist, like the Code of Conduct for responsible fisheries, the right to food guidelines, and the voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure of land, fisheries, and forests. So all of these are instruments that, that guide, or provide guidance to, to governments, but also to all the other stakeholders, including also the fishing communities themselves, in improving food security and poverty eradication policies, and in advancing sustainable development. Very briefly, you have the document, the advanced copy of the final text in front of you. Again, I apologize that it's not the final, final version yet. Uh, FAO is a bit slow and bureaucratic. Um, but just to walk you very briefly through the main topics that are covered in these guidelines. You can see the guidelines are divided into three major parts. The first part is the introduction, where the objectives of this instrument are, are laid out, and also the nature and scope. Sherry pointed out uh, that, for instance, the guidelines, they apply to capture fisheries and inland fisheries and marine fisheries, and they apply at the global level to all countries. There's a focus on developing countries, but the guidelines are indeed international. They do apply to all countries equally. Um, there's a section on the guiding principles. Yesterday, there was a call for, from several uh, commentators uh, for the, uh, on the importance of the human rights-based approach. So all these principles are enshrined in this introductory se section of the guidelines. And then there is a chapter on the relationship with other international instruments. Again, the code of conduct, the whole international framework that, that promotes uh, a global framework for, for fisheries development and for human rights. The, the thematic core part of the guidelines is, is in part two, the section that is uh, headed as responsible fisheries and sustainable development. In this core thematic section, we have a number of chapters that deal with thematic issues. The first one being the governance of tenure and small-scale fisheries and resource management, because that obviously remains very much at the core for the sector. Everything that is related to user rights, to access rights, uh, to, to management processes, different forms of, of, of uh, management at, at decentralized levels. This is very much promoted in, in these guidelines. But as I said yesterday, um, the guidelines also go beyond these traditional fisheries issues by having dedicated chapters on social development, on employment, um, on value chain, post-harvest and trade, gender equality, and also disaster risk and climate change. The guidelines then have a third part, which is entitled Ensuring an Enabling Environment and Supporting Implementation. In this last part, there's a number of, uh, of sections that, that, that provide guidance on how the principles of the guidelines can actually be implemented. What is it that is needed in order to, to make these work? For instance, policy coherence is an important aspect in here. Yesterday, 
here in the panel, there was a question, how can we consider the neoliberal uh, predominating system and the principles of the guidelines? So policy coherence is a very important aspect um, for the implementation of the guidelines. Um, we just heard the summary of the, of the reporting back from, from the discussions yesterday. And information, for instance, was, was one of the points that was raised. So this is also in the principles of these guidelines. Capacity development and overall implementation support and monitoring. So those are, are the topics in, in part three of these guidelines. Now, we are now here to, to look forward into what, what is coming next, what, what will happen in terms of implementation. To give you a bit more background information, uh, the 30th session of COFI, of the Committee uh, on Fisheries and FAO, uh, already tasked FAO to develop implementation strategies for the Small Scale Fisheries Guidelines implementation, and also um, to develop a global assistance <coughs> program to support this implementation. So in order to, to start working towards this implementation strategy and this global assistance program, um, we organized a workshop in March 2013 on strengthening organizations and coll collective action in fisheries. Uh, we also had an, had an online e-consultation in November, December 2013 to, to invite views and experiences and ideas from, from different people on how these guidelines can be implemented in the future. We also had the opportunity at the first regional symposium of sustainable small-scale fisheries in the Mediterranean and the Black Sea to have a special session in that event to discuss the implementation of the guidelines and again gather ideas on, on how to move towards implementation. And uh, what came out very strongly from, from all these processes, also from the consultation processes uh, before in the development of the guidelines was um, the need to maintain this inclusive and consensus-seeking spirit that was already guiding the development process of the guidelines, to maintain that spirit also during the implementation. So partnership, participation remain key, key principles that also need to be maintained in the implementation. Um, it was also very clear that for the implementation it will be very important that it's anchored at the at the national, at the local level, because that is where the change will happen. But that all of that is anchored also to a regional and international framework. So one of the, uh, the aims of the strategic approach in the implementation will be to mainstream the small-scale fisheries guidelines in, in different policies and strategies and in actions at, at all different levels, at the national level, at the regional level, and at the international level. So the role for FAO in this will be to, to advocate, to, to lobby, to, to promote this inclusion of the small-scale fisheries pers pers uh, guidelines and perspectives and needs also in, in broader development discussions, for instance, food security or, or ocean management, because those are the areas where FAO um, has a mandate to operate in. Uh, and then FAO will also contribute to further promote the collaboration between the implementation of the small-scale fisheries guidelines and the implementation of other international instruments like the uh, tenure guidelines and the right to food guidelines to, to strengthen these instruments. So what I would like to, to introduce to you briefly today is um, a global assistance program in support of the implementation of the guidelines. This was a proposal that was made to the Committee on Fisheries in June, and it was welcomed by all the participants in that COFI meeting. So this global assistance program to support the implementation of the guidelines would be based on, on four main pillars. One would be the raising awareness, another one strengthening the science and policy interface, and another one empowering stakeholders. I'm going to go into more detail into all of these. And all of this would be then uh, supported by, by another component that is dealing with the program management, the collaboration, and the monitoring of the implementation of this program and the guidelines. So let me give you a bit more detail on this very first component that has been proposed for this global assistance program, which is dealing with raising awareness. 
uh, knowledge products and outreach. It's very clear that the small scale fisheries guidelines can only be implemented if everyone is, is aware of them, knows their contents, knows their existence and understands them. So this is the very first step and again yesterday there was a call for instance for a simplified version. Um, we need different language versions. So, so all of that is key to, to move on with the implementation to make sure that this instrument does not remain just a piece of paper, but that we can actually use it for change on the ground. So in this context, it's very important for FAO to, to maintain and even further develop the engagement with partners to influence policies and funding priorities. So a whole range of different partners will play a major role in these awareness raising efforts. Again, to just give you some ideas what could be activities under this component in the, in the future program. Um, some activities could be the development of implementation guides. So how do we translate the thematic sections? How do we deal with these different topics that are addressed in the guidelines on the ground? How can we turn them into action? Practical examples, strategies, uh, guidance on how, how to do that. As I mentioned before, the translation of the guidelines into local languages, but also the public publication of the contents of the guidelines in other forms. We don't necessarily only have to provide the text. Illiteracy in fishing communities was mentioned yesterday. So we need to find other ways to communicate about these guidelines and the content of the, these guidelines. We can think about, for instance, community radios. We can think about different forms of, of, of disseminating and discussing the content of these guidelines and how they can be implemented with different, uh, different target groups. The same, there's a lot of development in social media, so we need to use all of these new forms of communication uh, to, to raise awareness. And of course, different events, conferences, uh, all of those events need to be uh, used to, to promote the, the knowledge about the guidelines. So the output of this first component of the Global Assistance Program was to create awareness and understanding of the small-scale fisheries guidelines among different stakeholders. And this is really at the heart of, of then working towards the implementation. The second component of the Global Assistance Program that has been proposed uh, is called Strengthening the Science Policy Interface. Again, um, in, the, in the summary that we heard this morning, there was a comment that science often is focusing on, on biological, natural science, but what we also need is uh, socioeconomic science. And we also need, when we talk here about science, it is not necessarily only research institutions, universities, but it is also the, the science that is lying within fishing communities, a traditional knowledge. We need to harness that and ensure that this also informs policy. So this is, um, this is the, the thinking behind this, uh, this second component of the global assistance programs, is this need for a strengthened knowledge base and the promotion of, of related policy reforms for sustainable resource management that is combined with so so social and economic development. So again, it is very important to, to realize that we need to look at the sector development in, in a broader way and considering um, different aspects, not only the, what is usually considered the traditional science uh, in, in fisheries management. It's not enough to only look at stack, stock assessments. We need to, to have a broader information base, base and a better dialogue between science and between uh, policy. And in science, again, I want to, to emphasize that the science understood here also including traditional knowledge. So examples of activities under this component would be, for instance, the development of best practices and lessons learned on different issues, um, case studies on practical examples of human rights-based approaches to fisheries management and local development. And here in South Africa, for instance, I hear that there are a number of cases also ongoing at the moment where the human rights-based approach is used to claim rights of, of, of fishing communities. Um, there needs to be a better collaboration and exchange of experiences between different research initiatives on small-scale fisheries issues, and also more interaction between the research community and the fishing communities. And there's a 
need for uh, support of the review of policy and legal frameworks based on that knowledge that is, is generated by research. So the expected outcome of this will also be to, un to have a better knowledge base, to, to take decisions, to have a better understanding of what is actually happening in the sector, what is needed, what are the challenges, but where also lie the opportunities to then develop the policies accordingly. The third component is about empowering stakeholders, capacity development and institutional strengthening. And this is really the backbone of where we see the backbone of the implementation. Because only if the different actors are able to actually participate effectively in all of these processes, we will be able to have a change. So this really um, is, a, is, a, is a very, very hard component of, of this global assistance program. Um, because developing capacity will contribute to empowering the different players. And only that can ensure that small-scale fisheries actors and communities can really actively shape the future of the sector. So examples of activities under this component um, include the identification of needs for organizational development and strengthening and the provision of support to do this. Um, it is also important to, to work more on the establishment of cross-sectoral linkages. We said before, it's, it is not only about what is happening in the fishery sector, but also what is happening around the fishery sector, the access to, to services, the, the education, health, all of those issues which are not necessarily dealt with within the fishery sector. And here, it will be a challenge to, to develop these capacities both at the institutions that traditionally deal with fisheries, but also for, for us, so to say, the, the CSOs that deal with fisheries, but also FAO, the fisheries department, for instance, to, to increase those cross-sectoral linkages and, and to work together uh, with other institutions also. All of this will also require the sensitization and the training of government officials and development partners in all of these issues. So the, the outcome of, of all these activities under this component would then be to create the building blocks for long-term process of continuous improvement, a better understanding and, and strength, uh, stronger linkages. So that governments and fishing communities in the end will be enabled to work together and also with other stakeholder groups to ensure secure and sustainable small-scale fisheries. So these three more thematic components of the Global Assistance Program will then be uh, held together by a fourth component, which is about supporting the implementation. So the program management, the collaboration, and the monitoring. So examples of activities under this component would be to develop a results-based management framework um, and again, also the, the, the promotion of implementation experiences and exchanges to understand what is it that works in the implementation process at different levels. What can we learn from each other? Uh, what has not worked? How can we improve things? Um, so all of these uh, would also need mechanisms to enable this, this sharing of experiences. And it, it's important also to have a monitoring system in place to understand how we are moving forward. To to have a way to, to be accountable, to demonstrate that these guidelines are more than just a, a piece of paper, that they are really helping, helping to achieve change. So the expected outcomes for this would be to have a transparent and efficient program management system, a better collaboration, and, uh, and a virtuous circle of events that is generated ultimately through this. A little bit on the proposed implementation modalities for this uh, global assistance program. Uh, it is foreseen to have a program secretariat that will be hosted in FAO, that will plan and oversee the activities, in, always in close collaboration with partners. As I said before, the entire implementation uh, strategy is based on the continuation and, uh, and strengthening of partnerships. Um, so the next in fact, the next uh, important issue for the program secretariat is to encourage and facilitate these, these partnerships and support the preparation of project proposals. All of this will then be supported by a program steering committee, which will provide guidance to the program secretariat 
And this program steering committee will consist of representatives from different um, stakeholder groups. All of this, of course, will need dedicated staff and funding in FAO. And we will need to have discussions on how to, how to design this program steering committee. Just a little bit more still on monitoring, which will be also an important task for the program secretariat in support, with support from the program steering committee. So the, the monitoring will also take place again in the committee on fisheries. So every two years when this committee meets, there will be uh, a discussion on how the guidelines have been implemented uh, at national and regional level. Uh, there was also, during the discussions leading up to the development of the guidelines, there was also um, a proposal to somehow involve other UN bodies in the monitoring, for instance, the Committee on Global Food Security. So this discussion still needs to be explored a bit, of, bit further. We need to see, can we bring in other, other bodies to increase accountability to ensure that the, the monitoring process of the, of the guidelines is thorough? Briefly on the next steps. So one step towards the implementation is actually this meeting, because we're going to have discussions later on where we seek your views. What is it that is needed? What, what, what can we do? Um, so this will be part of the implementation process already. And like we have this meeting here and the session on the implementation here, there will be other events um, where we are taking advantage as FAO to have a session, to have a side event, to discuss the implementation with different stakeholder groups. For instance, in, in Mexico, in Merida, there's going to be a, the second con Congress on Small Scale Fisheries that takes place in, in September. And again, there's going to be a two-hour session dedicated entirely to the implementation of the guidelines. The audience there is going to be a bit different. It's mainly a, a research academia audience. So we will get the views from, from, from that audience to understand and get feedback on how we can shape this implementation process. There's going to be a side event on the Committee on World Food Security uh, in October in Rome, again, on, on discussing the implementation. And all of the feedback that will come from these events will, will feed into a workshop that FAO is organizing in December in Rome to finalize this global assistance program and to understand, to, to start defining a more concrete plan of action. Uh, so this December workshop will, will be a very important step to to move forward with this implementation and where we will need all the feedback that we can get in order to, to prepare a background document for that meeting. And then there will be other events after that, of course, that continue where there will be opportunities to discuss these guidelines at international level, at regional level, at, at different levels. So I stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>